We're joined by Manish Kejriwal of Kedara Capital on money control at uh, Davos. Sir, thank you very much for talking to us. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kejriwal, you know, when we talk to you, we can't not but ask you about the private equity landscape and how do you see that shaping up in 2024? I saw an interview of Henry Kravis of KKR where he said that the next 10 billion for India will be deployed much faster. So, uh, how do you see the pace of deal making this year for private equity and for Kidara Capital too? Let's let's first take what Henry said, what about Henry, what uh, Henry Kravis said in uh, in KKR, and let's elevate that to all global firms who are active in Asia and in India. See what happens in those guys. Um, there are two things that are happening. They've already lay, raised large pools of capital for deployment in Asia. I think Bain and uh, KKR have both done seven or eight billion dollar funds for Asia for private equity. So has TPG, so has KKR, so has Carlyle. Now, what's happening there are two things. The money to India will go and pivot towards India because those pools of capital, historically, 40 or 50 percent of the money was going into China in those funds. As you all know, at least for the short term, and I'm actually a bull for a China in the long run, mm. but in the short term, that flow of money to China is going to slow down and get swamped, and that's going to pivot towards India. It's going to pivot not just to India, it's going to pivot to India, to Japan, to Indonesia, to Australia, but the two largest inflows, I believe, will be Japan and India, or it'll be India and Japan, but it'll be those two countries, I don't know who's going to be bigger or larger. So that, to Kravis's earlier interview, the money that was going in the rest of Asia, China specifically, is going to move and go more towards India. The second thing which you see, and we don't do that as Kedara, we are purely focused on a very narrow space, which is private equity at a part of private equity. And I'll get back to that later. But the global guys, interestingly, are doing many other asset classes. It's not just private equity, which is what KKR and others did 20 years ago. Today, a Blackstone, one of the largest investors in India, has a larger portfolio or as large in real estate. Uh, Kravis talked about uh, credit, private credit, which is a big play globally. Apollo today globally is more a credit player than a private equity player. Infrastructure, which typically was something they did not do. So between infrastructure, private credit, uh, public markets, and a bit of private equity, before the bond of the, what he took to deploy $10 billion is going to increase or the amount of time will contract dramatically. It's the pivot to, to answer it. The pivot from China to India, so they'll be forced to deploy more into India. You'll see the size of the teams on the ground in India increase to allow them to deploy more capital in India. And secondly, instead of just doing private equity, they'll do mother, many other asset classes. And to me, the biggest example of the whole focus on infrastructure, what the country really needs, um, one is at the sovereign level. So you see Japanese money coming in, you see Canadian money coming in, you see Singaporean money coming in either directly or through institutions. NIIF, NIF, what a great idea. I mean, that's doing large infra projects in a government, a private-public partnership with some of the largest global sovereigns, all partnered and being directed at priority projects which will have a profitable return. That's what NIF's main priority is. They also do some private equity. They also do a fund of funds, but their main issue is infrastructure. And then lastly, if you see where BlackRock, BlackRock, the last couple of months, has actually bought GIF. I mean, who would have thought a player like BlackRock, as large as BlackRock, it's a more than a trillion dollars, will actually acquire and operate uh, infrastructure funds. So their focus on alternatives, on the whole infra space, their ability to gather capital, whether it's from the retail side or from other large institutional investors, will significantly enhance the GIF team's ability to deploy that all across the world that do already, and both Africa, India, will benefit a lot with increasing flows of capital. Uh, the Kedara question, uh, what's your outlook this year? I mean, even if not, you know, in terms of specifics, any sectors that you like or, I'm happy to or even the pace of it? Yeah. No, no, listen, the pace, in our case, it bottoms up. When we see a good deal, we'll go after it. Also, our life is relatively straightforward and simple. We don't do 20 different asset classes. We don't do infrastructure. We don't do real estate. We don't do private capital. So we're just in private equity. So if the entire economy in India is about 100 units of capital, the relevant thing to us, you remove infrastructure, you remove real estate, you remove private credit, you're down to 30, 40, or 50. So it's a smaller thing. Within that 30, 40, or 50, 
what we know really well are a couple of sectors. We know financial services and consumer and consumer tech really, really well. We talked about a few companies in that. We also do a lot of stuff in tech services and in SaaS software. We also do some healthcare and some healthcare services. So those are the sectors we like. We will do a lot more in the coming years than that. If you look at, you know, you can't predict the future with a crystal ball. If you look at the last 12 months, if you know India, fundraising, new investments and exits were lower in 2020 than the previous years. For Kidara, it was the best year ever in terms of deployment and exits. We deployed more than $450 million in five deals in a time when the environment wasn't that strong. Why did that happen? We truly have a very unique combination of an investment team and an operating team. We have an investment team which is probably second to none in the country. We're very, very proud of it. It's grown. It's now almost 25 people on the investment side, another 15 on the operating side. We follow an operating partner model that we adopted from Clayton de Belair and Rice, which is a very large U.S. private equity firm, which has someone like Jack Welch as an operating partner. We have many significant CEOs um, who, behave, who work alongside us. So it's not just the investment team, but it's also the operating partners and operating directors, which get a lot of value to the different investments we make. And our USP, it's not how well we, it's literally our people. It's our culture. It's our values. Yeah. We, we value that. We, you know, reward our people, attract the best people, motivate them, uh, retain them, and do what's best for the company, whether or not we do a deal. Right. Um, 450 million across six deals at a time when everyone was talking about... 450 and five deals. Five deals. Uh, and $125 million of co-investments alongside. Right. At a time when everyone was pulling back from the market. That's significant. So, you know, what will you, what will it look like in 2024? And also, you know, Kidara has traditionally been a more public markets investor no, not, with, a, with, with some private market bets as well. Hmm. You're confusing us with Chris Capital. They do more of the public market. Hmm. We actually have never invested hmm. factually in a listed company. Hmm. Some of our companies we've taken public. Correct. So, Mani, where we took public, Avas, Spandana, hmm. Uh, there were six companies that we've taken, That's right. uh, which are diagnostics and hmm. so on and so forth. Hmm. Having said that, we've never, we've tried to, we can invest in public companies, but so far we have not. So, you can so will that change uh, in 2024? No, no, I, I, we're not going to, what we do well, we hmm. will stick to the game plan. Hmm. Uh, we will do more and more deals in our sweet spot in sectors that we fundamentally understand well. In companies which are good companies that we'll make better, we don't aim to do turnarounds. We don't take a sick company and make it better. We take a strong company with strong management team and take either minority position when we have full trust in the management team or we take a control-like situation. In both those situations, our investing and operating teams work hand-in-hand -hand with the management teams of the companies who deploy capital. We become a consigliere of sorts to the owner, to the entrepreneur, we are teams, all of us included, myself included, will do what's best for the company and hence what's best for us. So in a single answer, will we want to do public? We will, but we, we've seen in the past sticking to private equity has been the real focus. Um, final question, sir. One or two big trends that you would like to give for 2024. When I you know, talk to people here, no one can say anything without mentioning AI. But what are one of the, you know, one or two themes? One was a very good theme that you said on how global funds will deploy more in India. But anything else that you would like to call out that we should look out for in 2012? No, listen, I think the global funds doing more in India is less because of, you know, someone switching off uh, the faucet in, in any other geography. The reason is, for I'm only talking about the global funds who already have pan-Asian funds. There, the pivot will be more relatively more towards India. So if India was getting, let's say, 10 or 20% of a $7 billion fund from a Bain or a KKR, I don't know. They're, you should ask them the question. But my sense is that 10 or 20% might become 30 or 35%. So that's one big move, the allocation. Secondly, they'll become multi-asset class. Instead of just doing private equity or real estate, you'll see them into infrastructure, into private credit. KKR always did some private credit. But guys like Apollo who become a private credit shop, that focus really increased. The whole AI, Gen AI is fascinating. Listen, I love it. But in my mind, like many other things in the past, 
these fads will come and go. What businesses need to do is become very clearly understand what are the opportunities and what are the challenges which are posed by Gen AI. So even a company like it Enforces or a TCS, there'll be significant opportunities uh, in order to enable their clients on Gen AI. There's also a couple of threats, right? A whole level of automation. If you were a BPO company today, at the very basic level, doing the, the whole automation removal of if we've used AI so effectively in one or two of our portfolio companies, I, you know, I'll later contact them to speak to you. It's been transformational how they've reduced use AI for automation and reducing costs and how they've redeployed those same people on the marketing side, right? But I don't want to give away more on that publicly. I'll let you, you know, let him speak about that because he should get the full credit for that. So I think Gen AI as an investment theme, we will probably look at it and study it, but I think the bigger implication today and tomorrow will be what impact it has either as an opportunity. So uh, we have two or three tech, uh, tech services companies. What can they do to serve their clients better on this front? And at the same time, make sure that there is no threat which comes and wipes out a certain business model by Gen AI. I think for us to put dollars into Gen AI, there are far more smarter people in the Valley who are driving that, and we'll let them do that. We'll stick to our bread and butter, which is doing traditional private equity. On that note, thank you very much, Manish Kejriwal, for talking to us. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah.